Heavenly Father, it is a gift for all of us in here who have been called by your name to be called Christian, to be believers in Jesus Christ, to have eternal life, to have salvation, to have a future, a destiny, Father, in eternity with you. It's all because of your son, Jesus Christ, what he accomplished for us on the cross, what he came into the world to do. He suffered for us, Father. He died for our sins and rose from the dead. It's because of him, because of what he did, that we are called your children. And we have life now and forever with you. We thank you, Father, for this. We thank you, Father, for listening to our prayers, to the things that you have put upon our hearts. We lift up this Marine Heavenly Father, pray that he would be found and brought to safety and reunited, Father, with his church family. We ask for Kathy's total and complete healing. Father, I pray that you would just baffle the doctors and demonstrate, Heavenly Father, your power as you did in your son to just once again reverse the effects of the fall, to demonstrate, Father, the greater work that you're able to do in restoring a sinful person to yourself. Do this, Father, for her and for those in her life who need to know that this stuff, Father, we believe about and read is real. Bless our study tonight, Father, as we look at Jesus Christ is coming into the world, and how that was presented to us, Father, in your word by the apostles. Bless these times. Bless these things that we learn. Edification, growth, transformation, Father, it's your work. So we trust you. In Christ's name, amen. All right. You know, every Christmas I'm alarmed more and more in the society that we live in that is attempting at every turn and every stage to redefine everything we know and believe. And Christmas, I guess, is really when I, where I began to see this tremendous tendency on the part of the public to redefine what America is, to redefine what the church is, to redefine what marriage is. And they always come around to Christmas, and they always try to redefine Christmas by saying things like, well, what does Christmas mean to me? And that always bothers me when I hear like, people say things, well, to me, Christmas means this, or to me, Christmas means that. Christmas means one thing and one thing only. Christmas means the coming of God in Christ into the world to bring salvation to the human race. That is what Christmas means. That, that, that is all Christmas means. Uh, people say that, well, Christmas is a time that we get together with our families and we share nice memories and we exchange gifts between loved ones. Well, all that's true. That isn't Christmas. We would never get together with families had it not been for the birth of Christ. No one celebrated this day we call Christmas before Jesus was born into the world. The only reason why this time of celebration of Christ ex even exists annually is because he was born. Now, there are many debates over the date of the birth of Christ. Some say it wasn't really December 25th. Some say it was sometime in the spring between April and May. And I've, I've read the debates. I've read you know, the arguments for it. But really the important thing is not on what day he was born. It's the fact that he was born. That's what the apostles emphasize. They emphasize the fact that Christ was born. God became flesh. That's what they teach. That's what they emphasize. And that's what's most important. So in looking at this, we're going to look at the apostolic explanation of Christ coming into the world. Everybody's trying to offer their own spin on what Christmas means. We're going to look at what the eyewitnesses actually learned from Christ, God who came into the world. So we're going to answer four questions. We're not going to answer them systematically, I mean like, you know, one, two, three, four. They're going to be answered as these things are presented. So you'll have to look for the answers to the questions yourself. I am not that talented to try to finagle and orchestrate things. I'm just not that. I, I failed that class. That, I, I, I did not do well in that class at all. But the four questions are right there at the top of your paper. Who was sent into the world? Why did Christ come into the world? What does this mean for the world, and what does this mean for the church? That last question, I learned some things that I'd never saw before in my life. I don't, I'm not going to go into them either tonight or next week because I, don't, I haven't formulated everything yet, and I haven't got it written down yet. But those are the four questions that this particular lesson is going to seek to answer. First question, very simple, who was sent into the world? I asked my daughter this, and she said, Jesus. I'm like, no, no. Jesus is the name of his humanity. Jesus did not come into the world. God came into the world. And I shared this with a guy last week at work. And I said, this is an absolutely overwhelming, awesome thought. 
God entered into our hemisphere. He entered into our world, the habited world, the world that he created, the life of a human being. God entered into that sphere. That is huge. And the Lord gave me an opportunity to share with him a bit of the uniqueness of the God that we believe in because you trace religions throughout the world and none, none have ever taken upon themselves that responsibility of coming into the world, being clothed in human flesh, and then manifesting himself to people in ways they can understand so as to explain to the people who the one true God really is. Allah doesn't do that. Buddha, that thought never even crossed his mind. Whatever world religion you have, their gods are always distant from their people. They hate their subjects. They would rather just cast them into eternity, separated from him in hell forever. But the Christian faith is the only faith on planet Earth that proclaims that their God came into the world through the just physical birth. The bloody, nasty, gross humbling, humiliating way that God chose to come into this world is amazing. And it testifies to us the sort of God that we actually have, what kind of God we actually believe in, that would actually stoop this low to do this, not just for us, but for the entire human race. So God came into the world. You have some scriptures there. Micah 5, 2 states that he was from eternity before the heavens and the earth were created. God existed, second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. He was God manifested in the flesh. He is the true God and eternal life. And little points of application from 1 John 5, 20 and 21, John states that to believe in any other God other than the one revealed God in Christ who has come is to believe in a false God and in a false Christ. Because the idea of God in the flesh and Christ has one person, one person. And I learned a long time ago, listening to many, many, many many tapes ago, stated that if the God a person believes in is divorced from the revealed God in the person of Jesus Christ, that God is a figment of their imagination. He does not exist. He was formed within their own mind, and he is not God. Jesus Christ is the revealed God. You don't have it on your paper, but you can put it down there. John 1.18 states that no one has seen God at any time. No one has seen God at any time. To see God in all of his glory means death. None can look upon God in all that he is and live. So God had to veil his glory throughout redemptive history whenever he manifested himself to people. And even then, when he veiled his glory, when he revealed himself to people, people, when they realized they had an encounter with God, are like, I'm going to die. And the Lord kept having to say, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, because apparently to have an encounter with God is a terrifying thing. You know, so... So many people today have this idea that, you know, God's my buddy and he's my best friend and all that sort of stuff. If God would show up in your house and in your room tonight, you would be terrified and he would have to tell you, don't be afraid. It apparently is a very terrifying thing to come into contact with God. So John, the Apostle John says, oh, I'm sorry, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, that, and being in the bosom of the Father means that he is closest to the Father's affections. He is the beloved Son of God, the one loved by God from all eternity. It says that Jesus Christ, the, the one who has revealed, he has revealed God. And the word there, to reveal in the original Greek, means to explain, to bring forth into full revelation, to fully explain what God is really like. So in point one down here on your paper, Christmas is a celebration of the coming of God into the world specifically the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God, who was, is, and always will be co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Jesus Christ did not become God through his virgin birth. He always existed as God in eternity past. And there was never at any time where Jesus Christ was not eternally God at all times. He was always God. He became flesh. That was the transition from eternity to time that was so remarkable in the minds of John. I don't have it on your paper, but you can write John 1.14. The Word, who is eternal God, became flesh. And the word to, be, to become there means to transition, to come into being from one state into another, to transition from one position into another position. And we'll get to it later, but Philippians 2, 5 through 11 reveals how that transition took place. So Christmas is a celebration of the coming of God into the world, specifically the second person of the Godhead, the eternal Son of God. So point two right down there, God the eternal Son, 
was sent by God, the eternal Father, into the world to be the Savior of mankind. First of the Jews, and then on the heels of their rejection, all the nations. John 1, 29, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He came to save the world. He is the Christ, the Savior of the world. And the prophet Isaiah foretold that Christ would be a light to the Gentiles. I think, just from what I've read about church history and Christianity in general, I've come to be, I, I have become aware of the fact that I think we Gentiles, maybe, I know this was definitely true for me, but we Gentile believers in the body of Christ may not see how overwhelming the grace that we have received from God really is. Because there was a time, Ephesians 2 talks about it, where we had no claim on anything. And Gentiles had no claim on the grace of God whatsoever. They had to be be circumcised, they had to become proselytes, they had to become Jews, they had to go through all these rituals and all these different proselytizing in order to become a part of the people of God under the Old Testament dispensation. But now, on the heels of Israel's rejection, grace comes to the Gentiles. That was one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul got in so much trouble with the Jewish people of his day. And it's a huge, that, that, that is a, that's a radical change. I hate that word radical, but I can't think of any other way to say it. The fact that the grace the Jews rejected would then be go, would go to the Gentiles, apart from any need to conform themselves to the Jewish customs and cultures of the day, was completely radical. That we Gentiles who, had no, who were without God, without Christ, and without eternal life have now come be- beneficiaries of this grace only by faith in Jesus Christ apart from anything else. That is huge. That is huge. So on the heels of Israel's rejection, the grace of the Son of God that they rejected now goes to the Gentiles, and it has been going to the Gentiles ever since. And as we as Gentile believers in the body of Christ, we have the responsibility to turn around and evangelize the Jews as part of our responsibility, and to help them in varying ways, as the Apostle Paul teaches in Rome. So Israel, having rejected Christ from Jerusalem to Rome, the salvation that Christ came to bring into the world that they rejected is now being offered to us. These are the things that Christ did, the reasons why Christ came into the world. I like, I'm going to flip my paper over, 1 John 2, 2. 1 John 4.10, it states that Christ came into the world to be the propitiation for our sins. I like that word, propitiation. It's a very, it's a very tender word. It's a very heartfelt word. It it's, uh, expresses God's true intention not to judge the human race but to save the human race. Propitiation, the meaning of the, wor- of, of the word is that of a sacrifice provided by God where the sin of the guilty person is transferred to the sacrifice. So that the sacrifice suffers the wrath due to the sinner because of that sin. He suffers it instead of the person. And so that God's wrath, because of this sin-bearing substitute, is turned away from the sinner and is poured out upon the sin-bearing substitute. And now God turns back towards the guilty one and treats him in mercy. It is an offering, a sin offering, which turns away God's wrath away from the sinner and now treats that, and God now treats that person in grace. And this became very clear to me. That the coming of Christ into the world to do this, to turn God's wrath away from the human race through the death of Christ, is one of the clearest things in my head of a change of dispensation as a result of Christ coming into the world. Because had Christ not turned away God's wrath from the human race through his death on the cross, judgment would have fallen upon that generation without interruption. His propitiatory work on the cross is stated to be that which turns away God's wrath, not only from the, for the sins of those of us who have believed, but also for the sins of the whole human race, 1 John 2, 2. So God said, and this is one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why that Jesus Christ is said to be Savior, because only God in the flesh can do this. God sent his son to be the savior of the world, and this is the eyewitness testimony of the apostles. This is what they saw when Christ came into the world. This is what they heard him teach. This is what they saw him do. This is what they lived when the Holy Spirit came. This is what they experienced, and this is what Christ commissioned them to teach. So when we celebrate Christmas, we are celebrating the coming of eternal God into the world, to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. That is the order. That is the order. To be the only savior of both peoples by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the gospel alone, apart from from the works of the law to the glory of God alone.
Because had Israel succeeded in carrying out her dispensational responsibility before God through the law, Christ would have never have had to come into the world and die for sin. If the law was enough and sufficient to do it, Christ would not have needed to come. No one can earn their way into God's good standing apart from Christ in his death, burial, resurrection. There's no way. No other way. So the third point, explaining why Jesus Christ is the Savior. God in Christ is the Savior. Eternal God was given the name Jesus by the angel Gabriel, first to Mary in Luke 131, and then to Joseph, Matthew 121. The name Jesus is the name of his humanity and means the Lord is salvation. So in the name Jesus, we have both God and man in one person. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 states, there's only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That is such a definite statement. One God and one mediator in the military. I don't know if this is a bad illustration or not, but it helps me understand Christ the mediator. In the military, I, I don't know what it's like in the Army, but I know in the Marine Corps, you have someone who's called a warrant officer. Warrant officer is 100% enlisted man, 100% officer in one person. He came in through the ranks of the enlisted man. He enlisted as an enlisted man, but yet he distinguished himself so well that he was hand-selected by his superiors to become an officer. A warrant officer is 100% enlisted man. He is 100% officer. He represents the enlisted man to the officer and the officer to the enlisted man. Because, because he knows what it's like to be an enlisted man, he can communicate to the officers who, for the most part, having never been enlisted, you know, and, and lived in that particular condition, he's able to communicate the frustrations, the fears, the needs, and the desires of the enlisted man to the officer in ways the officer can understand and sympathize. And so the enlisted man, who has no clue of what it's like to be an officer, has in the warrant officer the one who's able to adequately communicate the policies and the orders of the officer down to the enlisted man in ways that he can understand. So I saw in the warrant officer a perfect illustration of Jesus Christ, the mediator. He's 100% enlisted man, 100% officer, representing both parties in one person. That's, so, I mean, that, that's Christ the mediator. He is the media. He is 100% God, 100% man, and one person representing both parties. I mean, so that's Christ the mediator. One, and, and, and that's all in that name, Jesus. You know, when, when we talk about believing in Jesus, and that particular statement, as powerful and as, I'll use the term again, radical as it is, has fallen on hard times lately. You can't pick up a Christian book or you can't listen to someone on the radio who says, oh, you're not just saved by believing in Jesus. You're not just saved by believing in Jesus. You're saved by believing in Jesus and submitting to his will and committing yourself to a life of discipleship and all these different things. The reason why they say such things is because they don't really know what it means to believe in Jesus. They don't understand it. To believe in Jesus, that name Jesus, the person first believing in Jesus for salvation may not know all that that entails, but God knows what that means. And God sees that person's faith, and that person is believing in all of who and what Jesus Christ is and what it is he came in, in, into the world to do. Because when you're believing in the name Jesus, you're believing in the person as well as in the work which the person accomplished. Now, it helps to explain that to a person, but not everyone comes to that perfect understanding of what it means to believe in Jesus the moment they first hear the gospel. So believing in Jesus is perfectly, and I love using it just because I know it frustrates people. What did you do to get saved? I believed in Jesus. Is that all you did? Yep. Jesus died for my sins, said I was, I was told that he was my way out of an eternal separation from judgment forever in the lake of fire. In the mind of an eight-year-old, the idea of swimming around for eternity in a burning lava pit did not sound appealing to me, and I was told Jesus was my way out. So I'm like, I'm there. I'm there. And yeah, all I did, I believed that Jesus, I believed in Jesus. I was told he died for my sins and that he was my Savior from the lake of fire, and I believed. That's all you did to be saved? That's all you have to do. You know, and when I believed in Jesus, I learned later it wasn't really me doing anything anyway. It was him doing it, so... By all means, tell people to believe in Jesus. It will frustrate the religious people in Christianity, but it is so liberating because it's so simple. It is so simple. And that's what sinners need to hear it, that simple. Believe in Jesus. His name being Jesus was ordained by God to be the explanation of who he is as well as his mission for coming into the world. 
The name Jesus explains everything. It explains everything. And the New Testament unfolds the meaning of that one name. It unfolds the meaning of that one name. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world to reverse the fall of man. Adam blew it. He ruined it for the entire human race. Christ comes in, into the world to turn everything around. The Lord Jesus came into the world to reverse the fall of man, to restore a sinful yet believing humanity to himself by grace alone, without the works of the law, and to make all things new. I like that statement in Revelation 21.5. Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. You read the New Testament, Christ makes all things new first with those who believe in him, and afterwards with creation and with the social order of things. People today, through the social gospel, are trying to straighten out the world's problems without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can't do that. They're trying to do it through legislation, political activism, and so on, but you can't do it that way. You can't do it. Because that's not what God's doing now. God is calling sinful people to himself through faith in Christ. That is, and he is making out of this people the body of Christ, the new creation. That's what we are. That's where all things being made new begin. Then when he comes back into the world, following the rapture and the, and the seventh week of death, then when he comes back into the world, he cleans house. He cleans the world up. He, he straightens up everything. He restores a perfect social order, a perfect kingdom. Righteous rule will once again rule throughout the world. And he will succeed where the first Adam failed. Salvation of the people come first. People come first. Then the creation is renewed. Romans makes that very clear about how we who have the first fruits of the Spirit within us, we groan within ourselves, waiting eager for our adoption, the redemption of the body, but right, groaning right along with us is creation, who's also waiting for her liberation from the bondage of sin and corruption the fall, and the fall of man. Excuse me. That's what Christ came into the world to do. I like Isaiah 45, 22. It's a summary. It's an Old Testament summary of what would later be preached by the apostles in the Gospels. Look unto me. And be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. The look unto me is faith in Christ crucified, according to Jesus in John 3, 14 through 15. As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And if you remember the story from Numbers, I believe it was 24, when the children of Israel sinned against God, he sent fiery serpents to destroy the people. Moses, as the mediator, interceded for them. God told Moses to lift up the serpent, or to lift up a pole and put a serpent on a pole. And anyone who looked in faith to the pole was delivered from the fiery serpents. So Jesus uses that illustration to state that faith in him, faith in him crucified, is looking to him for salvation from the sting of, from the sting of sin, which is death. So look unto me and be saved. The Apostle Paul teaches in Acts 16.31. I love this. The only quest, I mean, wouldn't you love it to be this easy? What, what must I do to be saved? I mean, that would be fantastic if everybody would just say that to us. You know, instead, they've got to distract us with so many other things. Well, who, where can get his wife and all these different you know, crazy things that people want to talk about to avoid the real issue. But they were asked, what must I do to be saved? If you were to ask that to ten Christians today, you would get seven to eight different answers. But yeah, I love the fact that the only answer that's given, the only answer that's given, is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That is the only answer that's given. Paul gives no other answer to the question. So in telling people what they must do to be saved, to, to state anything uh, additional to that is to add more and to say more what the apostles themselves actually taught. To all the ends of the earth, Jews and Gentiles. I love Acts 15.11, you know, the Jerusalem conference. I won't go into it, but it is, it, it is tremendous, the debate that was settled there. Well, it should have been settled. People still fight it today, law versus grace, but it should have been settled. But Peter states very clearly in Acts 15, 11, having listened to Paul's ministry work in the Gentiles, or among the Gentiles, states that salvation for both Jews and Gentiles is by grace, through faith. It's not any other way. It's not one for the Jews, one for the Gentiles. It's for both. He says, we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they. We Jews are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same manner as they, Gentiles. Saved the same way. The last statement, for I am God and there is none else. Now, point four, just carrying through this, you know, I guess logically, 
Eternal God took upon himself true humanity, true humanity without sin in order to fulfill the Father's plan for the first advent. Now, if you would, turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 through 17, there are eight reasons why the Lord Jesus Christ took upon himself true humanity. Eight reasons why. Hebrews 2, 19 through 17, reads like this. But we see Jesus, who was made for a little while lower than the angel, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Not some men every man. For it became him of whom, for, for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are, and those who are sanctified are all of one for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren saying I will declare your name unto my brethren in the midst of the church or the assembly will I sing praise to you. And again I will put my trust in him and again I, behold I in the children whom God has given me. Since then, the children share in, uh, or are partakers or share in flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For truly he took, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to come to the aid or to help those who are tempted. Eight reasons for why Jesus Christ took upon himself true humanity. The first one is that, by he, is, is that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now, I've talked with people before. I, I've talked with many people in the past. You know, I, I used to talk with people at I, Southeastern Bible College about election and atonement and the atoning work of Christ. There is no reason in the world why God would allow all members of the human race to be condemned because of Adam's sin, yet not provide salvation for the whole world. It makes no sense, scripturally, or even just in thinking about it, and why God would condemn the entire human race to eternal separation from him and not provide the way out for the entire human race and to only provide it for some. The New Testament is emphatically clear. Unlimited atonement is what Christ accomplished on the cross. The whole human race needs Christ. The second thing that Christ, or one of the reasons, one of the, or the second reason for why Jesus Christ took upon himself true humanity was it was to make the captain of our salvation perfect through sufferings. I mean, Jesus Christ did not come into the world qualified to go to the cross. He had to prove himself and pass through a series of tests. He had to succeed where Adam and Israel failed in facing temptations from the devil, and he had to be qualified through suffering to go to the cross and pay the penalty for the sins of the world. The third reason is to create for himself the church, the family of God. We are his handiwork. We are the beginnings of God's new creation. And the plan of God for the Son of God, it is the plan of God, I've stated this already, but I'll say it again because I, I like the way it sounds. It is the plan of God for the Son of God to reverse the effects of the fall of mankind, first in a believing humanity and then in a social and creative order. That is the order. That is the order. The fourth reason is that through his death on the cross, Jesus Christ, it is the purpose of him taking upon himself true humanity to destroy the devil. Now, this was foretold back in Genesis 3.15, right after the fall of man. The seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Colossians 2.15 states that Jesus Christ did that through his death on the cross. So destroying the devil through his death is victory over Satan and over his domain. The cross... You could say, prophetically put an end to it. We do not yet see all things brought into subjection to Christ, but through his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and session, all things indeed in the mind of God are put in subjection to him. We are just simply waiting for the day that that actually takes place. So the devil is destroyed. His kingdom is in shambles. 
I mean, you see him throughout, even the history of the Gospels and, and the book of Acts, you see him at war with himself. He's contradicting himself. He doesn't know, does he want to keep Jesus from going to the cross? Does he want Jesus to go to the cross? Does he want to keep Jesus? Does he want to you know, cause Christ to uh, compromise the Father's plan? Or does he want to destroy him through his death on the cross? I mean, you never, he, he's, he got his people fighting against Christ to do the very thing in, Ma in Matthew chapter 4 he tried to keep Christ from doing. And that's why Jesus says, a house divided against itself and a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. By fighting himself, he shows very clearly. He shows very clearly that he is a defeated enemy. So the one, two, three, four, fifth reason why Jesus Christ took upon himself true humanity was by his destruction of the devil to deliver those who were kept all their lifetime in slavery to the fear of death. You know, I often wonder, is that the reason why the Old Testament saints before the cross, always had this terror of going to the grave, of seeing the pit, where they would constantly pray for deliverance from it. And it wasn't until the death of Christ and his resurrection from the dead that that particular fear in facing death would be removed. Because I've often wondered why the book of Ecclesiastes portrays such a pessimistic view towards life and death and all things in between. And I've often wondered why certain psalms, David's like, oh, God, save me from death. And I'm like, save me from death? No, I'm going to heaven. I'm going, I don't, don't save me. So there seemed to be this nagging fear within them of not knowing with any sort of certainty what was beyond the grave. And death was something they constantly asked God to save them from until it came time, you know, for them naturally to go that way. The Christ's death on the cross takes that fear away. Because now, because of Christ coming into the world, we know heaven's real because we know where he came from. So we know what's on the other side of you know, him coming into the world the first time. And because he died and was buried and rose from the dead and sent him back into heaven, now, now we know what lies beyond death. So now as Christians, we can face with, face with certainty what lies beyond the grave because we know who's there waiting for us. So, something to think about. Jesus' victory over our slavery to the fear of death, it is a natural slavery to the fear of death, is the basis of the scriptural command, do not be afraid. That is the one thing that absolutely terrifies people to no end. It is either the fear of death, the process of dying, how they're going to die, when they're going to die, what's going to happen after they die. People are absolutely terrified of this. And Jesus came to liberate us and everyone who believes in him from that death. I'm sorry, from that fear of death. The next is to be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Now, we know that God was always merciful, has always been. God has always been merciful, always been merciful. But God coming in the flesh and revealing himself in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ actually experiencing, God in the flesh experiencing temptation, what that was like, without sin, no question. Jesus never sinned. He was without a, a nature of sin, and he never sinned. He never succumbed to the temptation. And I wonder what that must have felt like. You think about, you know, when we feel temptations, it's tough. You know, Gary said many times, I can resist anything but temptation. Because you know, it's hard. It's tough. It's very difficult. You know, I, people say we've got three enemies against us, the world, the flesh, and the devil. I think there are four. That's the world, the flesh, and the devil, and people who are ruled by the world, the flesh, and the devil. Throw that fourth one in there. So, I mean, it's just... We face it every day. We face it every single day. But imagine, now even when you give in to the temptation, whether you, you know, bite your wife's head off or whatever, there's a slight moment that, oh, gosh, it's over. The temptation's over. Jesus never had that. He felt the temptation all the time. The pressures of the cosmic system were around him all the time. And he felt them repeatedly. This is why it was called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The reason. He suffered all the time because of what was going on in this world. And so having gone through that, having suffered in temptation during the days of his humanity, he's able to sympathize. People, th We are tempted by things that God hates. Just, just admit, we've got to admit it. We are tempted by things which God hates. But to think that God is angry with you because you suffer because of these things is something that I see in the lives of so many Christians. They're, they, they, they're, they're convinced that because they're tempted with all these horrible things that God is so angry with them because they want what is evil. It is the human condition 
to want what is opposed to God. And Christ, having suffered that together with us, understanding what it's like in humanity to suffer those things, sympathizes. He's not angry. He says he's a merciful and faithful high priest. He is not angry about our struggle with temptation, regardless of how evil, horrible, and vicious it might be. He sympathizes with our weaknesses and with our struggles. Now, the last reason in Hebrews 2, 19, 9 through 17 was to make propitiation for the sins of the people. To offer, and basically, as I've say, stated already, is that simply is to offer grace freely as a gift apart from works, having fulfilled the law, thus delaying its judgment by turning away the wrath of God. Now, we know the wrath of God is going to come. Now, make no mistake. We are promised salvation from the coming wrath according to 1 Thessalonians 1.10, but it is coming. And those who reject Jesus Christ are going to enter into that time frame because of their rejection of Christ. It isn't what God wants. And when is that wrath going to come? We don't know. It comes like a thief in the night. It comes so quickly and so suddenly upon a world that is totally not prepared. We are promised, however, salvation from this wrath when it comes. And that's going to come through resurrection and rapture. We're out of here. We're, we are not appointed to that because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's like Egypt, Israel and Egypt, when judgment comes because of the blood applied, not because of how they were as people. And I love that because I know in, in those cottages in Egypt, you had some rotten, I mean, you just look, read Israel's history in the wilderness. You had some horribly vicious, evil, petty, bitter, vindictive people in those deals. But the only reason why God's judgment passed over them is because not because they were free from those things, but because the blood of Christ was applied prophetically. So when it comes time for judgment to fall, those of us who have believed in Jesus Christ, we're covered. We are covered. And we will be delivered through resurrection and rapture, not because of what kind of people we are, but simply the only reason is because of the blood of life. That's it. It's the only reason. So it will come. Now look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. 5 through 11. I really didn't think I'd get this far. <laughs> Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Just to bring this in with the context, Paul is discussing, he is talking about the believer's way of life as a citizen of heaven, which corresponds to the gospel of Christ, if you want to read that whole section and get a good picture of what that way of life looks like, Philippians 1.26 to Philippians 4.1 is that whole section. The section itself begins with the stand fast in the faith, and it ends with so stand fast. So in that particular section, Paul's revealing the way of life of the citizen of heaven and that it is to be conducted in a manner which corresponds to the gospel of Christ. So, and one of those here is humility of mind. But he uses the incarnation of Jesus Christ as a way to teach us what it means to have that mindset of humility, of obedience, of recognition of authority, and carrying out the will of the Father. Because he begins it by saying in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That mindset being humility of mind that regards others as more important than oneself, not every one of us looking or considering our own things, our own personal interests, but also those of others, because that is what Christ did when he came into the world, left heaven, entered into this world, took upon himself true humanity. He was regarding, and this is the shocker, you and I as more important than who he was and where he was. He regarded us as more important than himself. And this astounds me that this was, uh, this was a decision that he, that he made not after he took upon himself humanity, but this is a, is a decision that he made as God while never ceasing to be God. That absolutely stunned me that this is the decision God made before he took upon himself human flesh. So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Once again, the uniqueness of God. God says it through, through the prophet Isaiah to the nation of Israel, who's like me? Find a God in all the nations who is like me. Someone with whom I, you can compare me so that we can be equal. He says there is none. Even he himself, God who knows all things, says I know not one. There isn't. Such a God as this does not exist in the world. He's the only one. 
So let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I like the New American Standard translation a little better. But it states that he did not regard his equality with God as something to be held on to. And then I learned later uh, through Bob Bean's teaching that it was that he did not hang on to his equality as God so as it to be a hindrance to him coming into the world to fulfill the Father's plan. I thought that was a very good explanation. And one of my professors at Southeastern liked it. And so I, I was surprised. He says he made himself of no reputation. Now what that means... And, and, Literally in the Greek, it says he emptied himself. He emptied himself. It doesn't mean that he ceased being God when he became flesh. It simply means that he restricted temporarily his divine attributes so as, so as to fulfill the Father's plan as a, human, as a human being, succeeding where Adam failed. Man blew it, man must gain it back. Man lost it, man has to get it back. And being found, in, he made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant or a slave and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion or appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Philippians 2, 5-11, through 11, the Apostle Paul presents the whole incarnation of Christ thus Christmas, from the throne to the cradle, from the cradle to the cross, and from the cross to the crown, as an example, as I've already stated, as to how our lives are to be lived as citizens of heaven. The coming of Christ into the world and his way of life have become the pattern for the birth and lifestyle of the church age believer. That was what I learned. It just completely stumped me. Anyways, he was always God from all eternity. That's the first thing that Paul mentions. The second is that while remaining equal with God, and while never ceasing to be God, he left his exalted position in heaven as God and made himself of no reputation. That is, he emptied himself. God, in coming into the world to become flesh, laid aside the privileges, the honor, and the outward manifestation of his glory and took upon himself the form of a servant and became or entered into the likeness of men, became, was made in the likeness of men. Now, this is... I like this. This is Christmas explained by Paul. I mean, this is him explaining what took place on the day God became flesh. When you see in John 1, 14, the word became flesh, Philippians 2, 5 through 11 is the explanation of what that means. The Lord, in taking upon himself true humanity, became the lowest form of humanity on the social scale. The lowest. He became a slave. He did not enter into this world with pomp and glory. The kingdom did not come with outward show. He was born in a manger, came through, as one author put it, through the birth canal of a 15-year-old virgin, placed in a feeding trough because there was no room for him in the end. He became the lowest form of humanity on the social scale. Once again, please notice that this was a decision that he made as God. While in the lowest form of true humanity on the social scale, God and Jesus Christ submitted himself to the lowest form of punishment known in his day. The lowest. Even to this day, no form of capital punishment terrifies people more than crucifixion. Because Christians are still being crucified today. No form of execution. I mean, the electric chair. No matter what it is, I've heard people try to imagine, you know, it becomes, well, never mind, I'm not digressing. No form of punishment in any way, shape, or form comes close to creating that sort of humiliation. I mean, it's one thing if Jesus Christ just suffered as a martyr, but because he was rejected and subjected to the cross, that made Christianity scandalous in the first century. And it's still scandalous today, but there's too much of a veneer that has been, you know, wiped over it. It still, it, still, it, it still looks too, too nice and too pretty these days, in my opinion, for it to be authentic. But once again, that's just my thoughts and musings on it. Because Christianity was only for slaves. Only for those like the one they believed in, just a slave. It was for oppressed people, sinful people, the bums, that was as we call them today, the prostitutes, the pedophiles. Christianity was for them. 
for the homosexuals. It was for them. It wasn't for the elite, the high upstanding social amongst Greek and Roman culture. It wasn't for them. The Jews, Christ crucified, forget it. Forget it. That's a scandal because cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus was cursed by God. Yes, he was, but not in the way that they, that they see it and that they understand it. Because Christ wasn't cursed by God because of any sin he had committed. And that's what the Jews don't see. It was because of their sins he was cursed. So while in the lowest form of true humanity on the social scale, God and Jesus Christ submitted himself to the lowest form of punishment known in his day. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So the result is obvious. Jesus taught it. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. He taught it and lived it. He did it. When he gave that, he's probably thinking about the incarnation. When he left heaven and came into the world through virgin birth, he's probably thinking about, okay, he humbled himself, to do the Father's plan, and he did the Father's plan because it called for him to go to the cross and to rise from the dead. He ascended back into heaven, and now he has been highly exalted. If you want a cross-reference for this, read Isaiah 52, the last three verses of Isaiah 52, where it talks about that he would be highly exalted and extolled. God gave him the name which is above every name, the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The application of this Christmas event is given to us in Philippians 2.5. Let this mind, let this mindset, this way of thinking that Christ had be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. As the Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself to fulfill the Father's plan for the first advent, <coughs> Christmas, and was exalted by God the Father as a result. Here's the application of Christmas. So the church is to follow his example of humility and obedience in accordance with the predetermined plan of God for the church. I've shared this with people in the past. The will of God for every unsaved person is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive salvation as a gift without works. That, that's, that's it. Christ died for our sins on the cross, rose from the dead, faith in Christ, you were saved for all time and for all eternity. You cannot lose the gift of salvation, and you are a gift and can, who cannot be lost. I explain eternal security now to people along the lines like, you have received a gift that you can never lose, and you are a gift from God to Christ that he will never lose. You're, you're not being lost. You're, you're in. You're not getting out. I always like how Jim Bertel said it. It's like, once you believe in Jesus Christ, you are saved whether you like it or not. <laughs> you're his. I mean, he came into the world to seek and to save the lost. He's not going to lose the found again. He's not going to lose us again. He lost the human race the first time. Everyone whom he calls to himself by faith in Christ, he's not losing them again. In fact, that's Jesus' promise. He says, of all that the Father has given me, I will lose none. I'll raise them up the last day. That's it. We're not going to be lost. You can't be lost. Once you've come to Christ, you can't be lost ever again. <laughs> no. So that's the plan of God for the human race. What about the plan of God for the church? Well, Christmas, there's definitely applications of this in Christmas. Because Christ left heaven, became flesh. He left a former existence and through birth by the Holy Spirit entered into another existence. Is that not what happens to us at the moment of faith in Christ? Do we not get born again and transition out of one sphere of existence and enter into another sphere of existence by the power of the new birth? So we are to think in terms like how he thought. And it's all for the purpose of doing the will of God, which is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That is the plan of God for the church. That is the plan of God. I mean, it's the predetermined plan, the predestined. It's what you've been predestined to, to become conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. You have the Holy Spirit in you whose purpose it is to carry out that plan. He's not going to carry out any other plan. Because Christ did the will of the Father, the Holy Spirit's going to accomplish the will of the Son of God in your life. And that's the only plan he's going to accomplish. And what I have learned over the years is that when a believer is transformed into the image of Christ, all the teaching, all the witnessing, all the things that Scripture commands, specifically in the New Testament, is done in a way that reflects him. So many people are learning, and I was guilty of this. Early in my days, I was going to study every command in the Bible, and I was going to do it. I was going to do it, man. I was serious about obedience. I was very serious. 
I was going to learn them, memorize them, categorize them, and mentally do them. I was an absolute wreck, an absolute emotional wreck. I mean, just, you can't. It's impossible. But when you're committed to the outcome of spiritual growth, which is conformity to the image of Christ, when you're committed to that outcome, out of that growth, out of that conformity to the image of Christ by the Holy Spirit, comes the whole life that is a reflection of him. That is the plan of God for the church. I mean, that, that is what it is. It is for us to reflect him in every single way. Birth, life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, session, and reigning with him. That is the plan of God for us. I'm going to stop there because... Yeah, it's 7.23, and point five, we're going to get into too much. So I'm going to reserve 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 for next Wednesday. So, yeah, so hang on to your papers. If I add anything to it, I mean, I'm still looking at this. If I add anything to it, I'll bring a separate sheet, and you can just add it to what you already got. Oh, yeah. So Pam's like, no, no, don't add any more. <laughs> There's just so much that talks about Christ coming into the world. There's so much explanation, so much application to it. You got, I mean, the, the prophetic facts, the historical facts, and then the doctrinal facts, they're all there. And to see how they all relate to one another is truly fascinating. Truly fascinating. All right. Don't forget the Marine, that they find him. Don't forget Kathy, my brother's friend. And uh, I'm trying to think. Yes, uh, there's a young Hispanic boy at my work. His name is Rudy. <laughs> this kid is fantastic. I'm, I love this kid dearly. Hey, he's 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 one, probably one of the hardest working people I've ever seen in my life. He just keeps going and going and going and going and going until he leaves. He doesn't stop. He takes a break. He comes back and works. He goes to lunch. He comes back and works. This kid is so open to Christian things right now. He's a former Catholic, so he has that frame of reference back there to spiritual things. But he is, I mean, you share a verse with him. He's like, wow. Wow. I mean, he is so open. But I think there's a Catholic barrier there. That it's just not, you know, the lights haven't gone on yet. So that's what, so his name's Rudy. Um, pray for him. He's, I mean, he's like there. <laughs> he's, he's there. So, all right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for these things. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son. Thank you for explaining these things to us. Challenge us and encourage us by it. Father, we ask it in Christ's name.